Section 17 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 17. Outbreak of the Rebellion. Presiding at a Union Meeting. Mustering Officer of State Troops. Lion at Camp Jackson. Services tendered to the government. The 4th of March, 1861, came, and Abraham Lincoln was sworn to maintain the Union against all its enemies. The cessation of one state after another followed, until the eleven had gone out. On the 11th of April, Fort Sumter, a national fort in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina, was fired upon by the Southerners, and a few days after was captured. The Confederates proclaimed themselves aliens, and thereby debarred themselves of all right to claim protection under the Constitution of the United States. We did not admit the fact that they were aliens, but all the same they debarred themselves of the right to expect better treatment than people of any other foreign state who make war upon an independent nation. Upon the firing on Sumter, President Lincoln issued his first call for troops, and soon after a proclamation convening Congress in extra session. The call was for 75,000 volunteers for 90 days' service. If the shot fired at Fort Sumter was heard around the world, the call of the President for 75,000 men was heard throughout the northern states. There was not a state in the north of a million of inhabitants that would not have furnished the entire number faster than arms could have been supplied to them if it had been necessary. As soon as the news of the call for volunteers reached Galena, posters were stuck up calling for a meeting of the citizens at the courthouse in the evening. Business ceased entirely. All was excitement. For a time there were no party distinctions. All were Union men, determined to avenge the insult to the national flag. In the evening the courthouse was packed. Although a comparative stranger, I was called upon to preside. The sole reason, possibly, was that I had been in the army and had seen service. With much embarrassment and some prompting, I made out to announce the object of the meeting. Speeches were in order, but it is doubtful whether it would have been safe just then to make other than patriotic ones. There was probably no one in the house, however, who felt like making any other. The two principal speeches were by B. B. Howard, the postmaster, and a Breckinridge Democrat at the November election the fall before, and John A. Rawlins, an elector on the Douglas ticket. E. B. Washburn, with whom I was not acquainted at that time, came in after the meeting had been organized, and expressed, I understood afterwards, a little surprise that Galena could not furnish a presiding officer for such an occasion without taking a stranger. He came forward, and was introduced, and made a speech appealing to the patriotism of the meeting. After the speaking was over, volunteers were called for to form a company. The quota of Illinois had been fixed at six regiments, and it was supposed that one company would be as much as would be accepted from Galena. The company was raised, and the officers and non-commissioned officers elected before the meeting adjourned. 
I declined the captaincy before the balloting, but announced that I would aid the company in every way I could, and would be found in the service in some position if there should be a war. I never went into our leather store after that meeting to put up a package or to do other business. The ladies of Galena were quite as patriotic as the men. They could not enlist, but they conceived the idea of sending their first company to the field uniformed. They came to me to get a description of the United States uniform for infantry, subscribed and bought the material, procured tailors to cut out the garments, and the ladies made them up. In a few days, the company was in uniform and ready to report at the state capitol for assignment. The men all turned out the morning after their enlistment, and I took charge, divided them into squads, and superintended their drill. When they were ready to go to Springfield, I went with them and remained there until they were assigned to a regiment. There were so many more volunteers than had been called for that the question whom to accept was quite embarrassing to the governor, Richard Yates. The legislature was in session at the time, however, and came to his relief. A law was enacted authorizing the governor to accept the services of ten additional regiments, one from each congressional district, for one month, to be paid by the state but pledged to go into the service of the United States if there should be a further call during their term. Even with this relief, the governor was still very much embarrassed. Before the war was over, he was like the president when he was taken with the varioloid. At last he had something he could give to all who wanted it. In time, the Galena Company was mustered into the United States service, forming a part of the 11th Illinois Volunteer Infantry. My duties, I thought, had ended at Springfield, and I was prepared to start home by the evening train, leaving at nine o'clock. Up to that time, I do not think I had been introduced to Governor Yates, or had ever spoken to him. I knew him by sight, however, because he was living at the same hotel, and I often saw him at table. The evening I was to quit the capital, I left the supper room before the governor and was standing at the front door when he came out. He spoke to me, calling me by my old army title, Captain, and said he understood that I was about leaving the city. I answered that I was. He said he would be glad if I would remain overnight and call at the executive office the next morning. I complied with his request and was asked to go into the adjutant general's office and render such assistance as I could, the governor saying that my army experience would be of great service there. I accepted the proposition. My old army experience I found indeed of very great service. I was no clerk, nor had I any capacity to become one. The only place I ever found in my life to put a paper so as to find it again was either a side coat pocket or the hands of a clerk or secretary more careful than myself. But I had been quartermaster commissary, and adjutant in the field. The army forms were familiar to me, and I could direct how they should be made out. There was a clerk in the office of the adjutant general who supplied my deficiencies, the ease with which the state of Illinois settled its accounts with the government at the close of the war is evident of the efficiency of Mr. Loomis as an accountant on a large scale. He remained in the office until that time. As I have stated, the legislature authorized the governor 
to accept the services of ten additional regiments. I had charge of mustering these regiments into the state service. They were assembled at the most convenient railroad centers in their respective congressional districts. I detailed officers to muster in a portion of them, but mustered three in the southern part of the state myself. One of these was to assemble at Belleville, some eighteen miles southeast of St. Louis. When I got there, I found that only one or two companies had arrived. There was no probability of the regiment coming together under five days. This gave me a few idle days, which I concluded to spend in St. Louis. There was a considerable force of state militia at Camp Jackson on the outskirts of St. Louis at the time. There is but little doubt that it was the design of Governor Claiborne Jackson to have these troops ready to seize the United States arsenal and the city of St. Louis. Why they did not do so, I do not know. There was but a small garrison, two companies, I think, under Captain N. Lyon at the arsenal, and but for the timely services of the Honorable F. P. Blair, I have little doubt that St. Louis would have gone into rebel hands, and with it the arsenal with all its arms and ammunition. Blair was a leader among the Union men of St. Louis in 1861. There was no state government in Missouri at the time that would sanction the raising of troops or commissioned officers to protect United States property, but Blair had probably procured some form of authority from the President to raise troops in Missouri and to muster them into the service of the United States. At all events, he did raise a regiment, and took command himself as colonel. With this force, he reported to Captain Lyon, and placed himself and regiment under his orders. It was whispered that Lyon, thus reinforced, intended to break up Camp Jackson, and capture the militia. I went down to the arsenal in the morning to see the troops start out. I had known Lyon for two years at West Point, and in the old army afterwards. Blair I knew very well by sight. I had heard him speak in the canvas of 1858, possibly several times, but I had never spoken to him. As the troops marched out of the enclosure around the arsenal, Blair was on his horse outside, forming them into line preparatory to their march. I introduced myself to him, and had a few moments' conversation, and expressed my sympathy with his purpose. This was my first personal acquaintance with the Honorable, afterwards Major General, F. P. Blair. Camp Jackson surrendered without a fight, and the garrison was marched down to the arsenal as prisoners of war. Up to this time, the enemies of the government in St. Louis had been bold and defiant, while Union men were quiet but determined. The enemies had their headquarters in a central and public position on Pine Street, near Fifth, from which the rebel flag was flaunted boldly. The Union men had a place of meeting somewhere in the city, I did not know where, and I doubt whether they dared to enrage the enemies of the government by placing the national flag outside their headquarters. As soon as the news of the capture of Camp Jackson reached the city, the condition of affairs was changed. Union men became rampant, aggressive, and, if you will, intolerant. They proclaimed their sentiments boldly, and were impatient at anything like disrespect for the Union. The secessionists became quiet, but were filled with suppressed rage. They had been playing the bully. The Union men ordered the rebel flag taken down from the building on Pine Street. 
the command was given in tones of authority and it was taken down never to be raised again in st louis i witnessed the scene i had heard of the surrender of the camp and that the garrison was on its way to the arsenal i had seen the troops start out in the morning and had wished them success i now determined to go to the arsenal and await their arrival and congratulate them i stepped on a car standing at the corner of fourth and pine streets and saw a crowd of people standing quietly in front of the headquarters who were there for the purpose of hauling down the flag there were squads of other people at intervals down the street they too were quiet but filled with suppressed rage and muttered their resentment at the insult to what they called their flag before the car i was in had started a dapper little fellow he would be called a dude at this day stepped in he was in a great state of excitement and used adjectives freely to express his contempt for the union and for those who had just perpetrated such an outrage upon the rights of a free people there was only one other passenger in the car besides myself when this young man entered he evidently expected to find nothing but sympathy when he got away from the mud sills engaged in compelling a free people to pull down a flag they adored he turned to me saying things have come to a pretty pass when a free people can't choose their own flag where i come from if a man dares to say a word in favor of the union we hang him to a limb of the first tree we come to i replied that after all we were not so intolerant in st louis as we might be i had not seen a single rebel hung yet nor heard of one there were plenty of them who ought to be however the young man subsided he was so crestfallen that i believe if i had ordered him to leave the car he would have gone quietly out saying to himself more yankee oppression by nightfall the late defenders of camp jackson were all within the walls of the st louis arsenal prisoners of war the next day i left st louis for mattoon illinois where i was to muster in the regiment from that congressional district this was the twenty first illinois infantry the regiment of which i subsequently became colonel i mustered one regiment afterwards when my services for the state were about closed brigadier general john pope was stationed at springfield as united states mustering officer all the time i was in the state service he was a native of illinois and well acquainted with most of the prominent men in the state i was a carpet-bagger and knew but few of them while i was on duty at springfield the senators representatives in congress ex-governors and the state legislators were nearly all at the state capitol the only acquaintance i made among them was with the governor whom i was serving and by chance with senator s a douglas the only members of congress i knew were washburn and philip folk with the former though he represented my district and we were citizens of the same town i only became acquainted at the meeting when the first company of galena volunteers was raised folk i had known in st louis when i was a citizen of that city i had been three years at west point with pope and had served with him a short time during the mexican war under general taylor i saw a good deal of him during my service with the state on one occasion he said to me that i ought to go into the united states service i told him i intended to do so if there was a war he spoke of his acquaintance with the public men of the state and said he could get them to recommend me for a position and that he would do all he could for me 
I declined to receive endorsement for permission to fight for my country. Going home for a day or two, soon after this conversation with General Pope, I wrote from Galena the following letter to the Adjutant General of the Army. Galena, Illinois, May 24th, 1861. Colonel L. Thomas, Adjutant General, USA, Washington, D.C. Sir, having served for fifteen years in the regular army, including four years at West Point, and feeling it the duty of every one who has been educated at the government expense to offer their services for the support of that government, I have the honor, very respectfully, to tender my services until the close of the war, in such capacity as may be offered. I would say, in view of my present age and length of service, I feel myself competent to command a regiment. If the President, in his judgment, should see fit to entrust one to me. Since the first call of the President, I have been serving on the staff of the Governor of this state, rendering such aid as I could in the organization of our state militia, and am still engaged in that capacity. A letter addressed to me at Springfield, Illinois, will reach me. I am very respectfully your obedient servant, U.S. Grant. This letter failed to elicit an answer from the Adjutant General of the Army. I presume it was heartily read by him, and certainly it could not have been submitted to higher authority. Subsequent to the war, General Badeau, having heard of this letter, applied to the War Department for a copy of it. The letter could not be found, and no one recollected ever having seen it. I took no copy when it was written. Long after the application of General Badu, General Townsend, who had become Adjutant General of the Army, while packing up papers preparatory to the removal of his office, found this letter in some out-of-the-way place. It had not been destroyed, but it had not been regularly filed away. I felt some hesitation in suggesting rank as high as the colonelcy, of a regiment, feeling somewhat doubtful whether I would be equal to the position. But I had seen nearly every colonel who had been mustered in from the state of Illinois, and some from Indiana, and felt that if they could command a regiment properly, and with credit, I could also. Having but little to do after the muster of the last of the regiments authorized by the state legislature, I asked and obtained of the governor leave of absence for a week to visit my parents in Covington, Kentucky, immediately opposite Cincinnati. General McClellan had been made a major general and had his headquarters at Cincinnati. In reality, I wanted to see him. I had known him slightly at West Point, where we served one year together, and in the Mexican War. I was in hopes that, when he saw me, he would offer me a position on his staff. I called on two successive days at his office, but failed to see him on either occasion, and returned to Springfield. End of Section 17 Recording by Jim Clevenger Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Section 18 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 18. Appointed Colonel of the 21st Illinois. Personnel of the Regiment. 
General Logan March to Missouri Movement against Harris at Florida, Missouri General Pope in command Stationed at Mexico, Missouri While I was absent from the state capital on this occasion, the President's second call for troops was issued. This time it was for 300,000 men for three years or the war. This brought into the United States service all the regiments then in the state service. These had elected their officers from highest to lowest, and were accepted with their organizations as they were, except in two instances. A Chicago regiment, the 19th Infantry, had elected a very young man to the colonelcy. When it came to taking the field, the regiment asked to have another appointed colonel, and the one they had previously chosen made lieutenant colonel. The 21st Regiment of Infantry, mustered in by me at Mattoon, refused to go into the service with the colonel of their selection in any position. While I was still absent, Governor Yates appointed me colonel of this latter regiment. A few days after I was in charge of it and in camp on the fair grounds near Springfield. My regiment was composed in large part of young men of as good social position as any in their section of the state. It embraced the sons of farmers, lawyers, physicians, politicians, merchants, bankers, and ministers, and some men of maturer years who had filled such positions themselves. There were also men in it who could be led astray and the colonel, elected by the votes of the regiment, had proved to be fully capable of developing all there was in his men of recklessness. It was said that he even went so far at times as to take the guard from their posts and go with them to the village nearby and make a night of it. When there came a prospect of battle, the regiment wanted to have someone else to lead them. I found it very hard work for a few days to bring all the men into anything like subordination, but the great majority favored discipline, and by the application of a little regular army punishment, all were reduced to as good discipline as one could ask. The ten regiments which had volunteered in the state service for thirty days, it will be remembered, had done so with a pledge to go into the national service if called upon within that time. When they volunteered, the government had only called for ninety days enlistments. Men were called now for three years or the war. They felt that this change of period released them from the obligation of re-volunteering. When I was appointed colonel, the 21st Regiment was still in the state service. About the time they were to be mustered into the United States service, such of them as would go, two members of Congress from the state, McClernand and Logan, appeared at the Capitol and I was introduced to them. I had never seen either of them before, but I had read a great deal about them, and particularly about Logan in the newspapers. Both were Democratic members of Congress, and Logan had been elected from the southern district of the state, where he had a majority of 18,000 over his Republican competitor. His district had been settled originally by people from the southern states and at the breaking out of secession they sympathized with the South. At the first outbreak of war some of them joined the Southern Army. Many others were preparing to do so. Others rode over the country at night, denouncing the Union, and made it as necessary to guard railroad bridges over which national troops had to pass in southern Illinois, as it was in Kentucky, or any of the border slave states. Logan's popularity in this district was unbounded, 
he knew almost enough of the people in it by their christian names to form an ordinary congressional district as he went in politics so his district was sure to go the republican papers had been demanding that he should announce where he stood on the questions which at that time engrossed the whole of public thought some were very bitter in their denunciations of this silence logan was not a man to be coerced into an utterance by threats he did however come out in a speech before the adjournment of the special session of congress which was convened by the president soon after his inauguration and announced his undying loyalty and devotion to the union but i had not happened to see that speech so that when i first met logan my impressions were those formed from reading denunciations of him mcclernand on the other hand had early taken strong grounds for the maintenance of the union and had been praised accordingly by the republican papers the gentlemen who presented these two members of congress asked me if i would have any objections to their addressing my regiment i hesitated a little before answering it was but a few days before the time set for mustering into the united states service such of the men as were willing to volunteer for three years or the war i had some doubt as to the effect a speech from logan might have but as he was with mcclernand whose sentiments on the all-absorbing questions of the day were well known i gave my consent mcclernand spoke first and logan followed in a speech which he has hardly equaled since for force and eloquence it breathed a loyalty and devotion to the union which inspired my men to such a point that they would have volunteered to remain in the army as long as an enemy of the country continued to bear arms against it they entered the united states service almost to a man general logan went to his part of the state and gave his attention to raising troops the very men who at first made it necessary to guard the roads in southern illinois became the defenders of the union logan entered the service himself as colonel of a regiment and rapidly rose to the rank of major general his district which had promised at first to give much trouble to the government filled every call made upon it for troops without resorting to the draft there was no call made when there were not more volunteers than were asked for that congressional district stands credited at the war department today with furnishing more men for the army than it was called on to supply i remained in springfield with my regiment until the third of july when i was ordered to quincy illinois by that time the regiment was in a good state of discipline and the officers and men were well up in the company drill there was direct railroad communication between springfield and quincy but i thought it would be good preparation for the troops to march there we had no transportation for our camp and garrison equipage so wagons were hired for the occasion and on the third of july we started there was no hurry but fair marches were made every day until the illinois river was crossed there i was overtaken by a dispatch saying that the destination of the regiment had been changed to ironton missouri and ordering me to halt where i was and await the arrival of a steamer which had been dispatched up the illinois river to take the regiment to st louis the boat when it did come grounded on a sandbar a few miles below where we were in camp we remained there several days waiting to have the boat get off the bar but before this occurred news came that an illinois regiment was surrounded by rebels at a point on the hannibal and st joe railroad some miles west of palmyra in missouri 
and I was ordered to proceed with all dispatch to their relief. We took the cars and reached Quincy in a few hours. When I left Galena for the last time to take command of the 21st Regiment, I took with me my oldest son, Frederick D. Grant, then a lad of eleven years of age. On receiving the order to take rail for Quincy, I wrote to Mrs. Grant to relieve what I supposed would be her great anxiety for one so young going into danger that I would send Fred home from Quincy by river. I received a prompt letter in reply decidedly disapproving my proposition and urging that the lad should be allowed to accompany me. It came too late. Fred was already on his way up to Mississippi, bound for Dubuque, Iowa, from which place there was a railroad to Galena. My sensations as we approached what I supposed might be a field of battle were anything but agreeable. I had been in all the engagements in Mexico that it was possible for one person to be in, but not in command. If someone else had been colonel, and I had been lieutenant colonel, I do not think I would have felt any trepidation. Before we were prepared to cross the Mississippi River at Quincy, my anxiety was relieved, for the men of the besieged regiment came straggling into town. I am inclined to think both sides got frightened and ran away. I took my regiment to Palmyra and remained there for a few days until relieved by the 19th Illinois Infantry. From Palmyra, I proceeded to Salt River, the railroad bridge over which had been destroyed by the enemy. Colonel John M. Palmer, at that time, commanded the 13th Illinois, which was acting as a guard to workmen who were engaged in rebuilding this bridge. Palmer was my senior, and commanded the two regiments as long as we remained together. The bridge was finished in about two weeks, and I received orders to move against Colonel Thomas Harris, who was said to be encamped at the little town of Florida, some twenty-five miles south of where we then were. At the time of which I now write, we had no transportation, and the country about Salt River was sparsely settled, so that it took some days to collect teams and drivers enough to move the camp and garrison equipage of a regiment nearly a thousand strong, together with a week's supply of provisions and some ammunition. While preparations for the move were going on, I felt quite comfortable, but when we got on the road and found every house deserted, I was anything but easy. In the twenty-five miles we had to march, we did not see a person, old or young, male or female, except two horsemen, who were on a road that crossed ours. As soon as they saw us, they decamped as fast as their horses could carry them. I kept my men in the ranks, and forbade their entering any of the deserted houses, or taking anything from them. We halted at night on the road, and proceeded the next morning, at an early hour. Harris had been encamped in a creek bottom for the sake of being near water. The hills on either side of the creek extended to a considerable height, possibly more than a hundred feet. As we approached the brow of the hill, from which it was expected we could see Harris's camp and possibly find his men ready formed to meet us, my heart kept getting higher and higher until it felt to me as though it was in my throat. I would have given anything then to have been back in Illinois, but I had not the moral courage to halt and consider what to do. I kept right on. When we reached a point from which the valley below was in full view, I halted. The place where Harris had been encamped a few days before was still there, and the marks of a recent encampment were plainly visible, but the troops were gone. My heart resumed its place. It occurred to me at once that Harris had been as much afraid of me as I had been of him. 
this was a view of the question i had never taken before but it was one i never forgot afterwards from that event to the close of the war i never experienced trepidation upon confronting an enemy though i always felt more or less anxiety i never forgot that he had as much reason to fear my forces as i had his the lesson was valuable inquiries at the village of florida divulged the fact that colonel harris learning of my intended movement while my transportation was being collected took time by the forelock and left florida before i had started from salt river he had increased the distance between us by forty miles the next day i started back to my old camp at salt river bridge the citizens living on the line of our march had returned to their houses after we passed and finding everything in good order nothing carried away they were at their front doors ready to greet us now they had evidently been led to believe that the national troops carried death and devastation with them wherever they went in a short time after our return to salt river bridge i was ordered with my regiment to the town of mexico general pope was then commanding the district embracing all of the state of missouri between the mississippi and missouri rivers with his headquarters in the village of mexico i was assigned to the command of a sub-district embracing the troops in the immediate neighborhood some three regiments of infantry and a section of artillery there was one regiment encamped by the side of mine i assumed command of the whole and the first night sent the commander of the other regiment the parole and countersign not wishing to be outdone in courtesy he immediately sent me the countersign for his regiment for the night when he was informed that the countersign sent to him was for use with his regiment as well as mine it was difficult to make him understand that this was not an unwarranted interference of one colonel over another no doubt he attributed it for the time to the presumption of a graduate of west point over a volunteer pure and simple but the question was soon settled and we had no further trouble my arrival in mexico had been preceded by that of two or three regiments in which proper discipline had not been maintained and the men had been in the habit of visiting houses without invitation and helping themselves to food and drink or demanding them from the occupants they carried their muskets while out of camp and made every man they found take the oath of allegiance to the government i at once published orders prohibiting the soldiers from going into private houses unless invited by the inhabitants and from appropriating private property to their own or to government uses the people were no longer molested or made afraid i received the most marked courtesy from the citizens of mexico as long as i remained there up to this time my regiment had not been carried in the school of the soldier beyond the company drill except that it had received some training on the march from springfield to the illinois river there was now a good opportunity of exercising it in the battalion drill while i was at west point the tactics used in the army had been scots and the musket the flintlock i had never looked at a copy of tactics from the time of my graduation my standing in that branch of studies had been near the foot of the class in the mexican war in the summer of eighteen forty six i had been appointed regimental quartermaster and commissary and had not been at a battalion drill since the arms had been changed since then and hardy's tactics had been adopted i got a copy of tactics and studied one lesson intending to confine the exercise of the first day to the commands i had thus learned by pursuing this course from day to day i thought i would soon get through the volume we were encamped just outside of town on the common among scattering suburban houses 
with enclosed gardens, and when I got my regiment in line and rode to the front, I soon saw that if I attempted to follow the lesson I had studied, I would have to clear away some of the houses and garden fences to make room. I perceived at once, however, that Hardy's tactics, a mere translation from the French with Hardy's name attached, was nothing more than common sense, and the progress of the age applied to Scott's system. The commands were abbreviated, and the movement expedited. Under the old tactics, almost every change in the order of march was preceded by a halt, then came the change, and then the forward march. With the new tactics, all these changes could be made while in motion. I found no trouble in giving commands that would take my regiment where it wanted to go and carry it around all obstacles. I do not believe that the officers of the regiment ever discovered that I had never studied the tactics that I used. End of section 18. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at jocclev.com. of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 19. Commissioned Brigadier General command at ironton missouri jefferson city cape gerardo general prentiss seizure of paducah headquarters at cairo i had not been in mexico many weeks when reading a st louis paper i found the president had asked the illinois delegation in congress to recommend some citizens of the state for the position of brigadier general and that they had unanimously recommended me as first on a list of seven. I was very much surprised because, as I have said, my acquaintance with the congressman was very limited, and I did not know of anything I had done to inspire such confidence. The papers of the next day announced that my name, with three others, had been sent to the Senate, and a few days after, our confirmation was announced. When appointed Brigadier General, I at once thought it proper that one of my aides should come from the regiment I had been commanding, and so selected Lieutenant C. B. Legault. While living in St. Louis, I had had a desk in the law office of McClellan, Moody, and Hillier. Difference in views between the members of the firm on the questions of the day and general hard times in the border cities had broken up this firm hillier was quite a young man then in his twenties and very brilliant i asked him to accept a place on my staff i also wanted to take one man from my new home galena the canvas in the presidential campaign the fall before had brought out a young lawyer by the name of john a rawlins who proved himself one of the ablest speakers in the state he was also a candidate for elector on the douglas ticket when sumter was fired upon and the integrity of the union threatened there was no man more ready to serve his country than he I wrote at once, asking him to accept the position of assistant adjutant general with the rank of captain on my staff. He was about entering the service as major of a new regiment, then organizing in the northwestern part of the state, but he threw this up and accepted my offer. Neither Hillier nor Legault proved to have any particular taste or special qualifications for the duties of the soldier, and the former resigned during the Vicksburg campaign, the latter I relieved after the Battle of Chattanooga. 
Rawlins remained with me as long as he lived, and rose to the rank of Brigadier General and Chief of Staff to the General of the Army, an office created for him before the war closed. He was an able man, possessed of great firmness, and could say no so emphatically to a request which he thought should not be granted, that the person he was addressing would understand at once that there was no use of pressing the matter. General Rawlins was a very useful officer in other ways than this. I became very much attached to him. Shortly after my promotion, I was ordered to Ironton, Missouri, to command a district in that part of the state, and took the 21st Illinois, my old regiment, with me. Several other regiments were ordered to the same destination about the same time. Ironton is on the Iron Mountain Railroad, about 70 miles south of St. Louis, and situated among hills rising almost to the dignity of mountains. When I reached there, about the 8th of August, Colonel B. Gratz Brown, afterwards Governor of Missouri and, in 1872, Vice Presidential Candidate, was in command. Some of his troops were ninety days men, and their time had expired some time before. The men had no clothing but what they had volunteered in, and much of this was so worn that it would hardly stay on. General Hardy, the author of the tactics I did not study, was at Greenville some twenty-five miles further south, it was said, with five thousand Confederate troops. Under these circumstances, Colonel Brown's command was very much demoralized. A squadron of cavalry could have ridden into the valley and captured the entire force. Brown himself was gladder to see me on that occasion than he ever has been since. I relieved him and sent all his men home within a day or two to be mustered out of service. Within ten days after reading Ironton, I was prepared to take the offensive against the enemy at Greenville. I sent a column east, out of the valley we were in, with orders to swing around to the south and west and come into the Greenville Road ten miles south of Ironton. Another column marched on the direct road and went into camp at the point designated for the two columns to meet. I was to ride out the next morning and take personal command of the movement. My experience against Harris in northern Missouri had inspired me with confidence. But when the evening train came in, it brought General B. M. Prentiss with orders to take command of the district. His orders did not relieve me, but I knew that by law I was senior, and at that time even the President did not have the authority to assign a junior to command a senior of the same grade. I therefore gave General Prentiss the situation of the troops and the general condition of affairs, and started for St. Louis the same day. The movement against the rebels at Greenville went no further. From St. Louis I was ordered to Jefferson City, the capital of the state, to take command. General Sterling Price of the Confederate Army was thought to be threatening the capital, Lexington, Chillicothe, and other comparatively large towns in the central part of Missouri. I found a good many troops in Jefferson City, but in the greatest confusion, and no one person knew where they all were. Colonel Mulligan, a gallant man, was in command, but he had not been educated as yet to his new profession and did not know how to maintain discipline. I found that volunteers had obtained permission from the department commander, or claimed they had, to raise some of them regiments, some battalions, some companies. 
the officers to be commissioned according to the number of men they brought into the service there were recruiting stations all over town with notices rudely lettered on boards over the doors announcing the arm of service and length of time for which recruits at that station would be received the law required all volunteers to serve for three years or the war but in jefferson city in august eighteen sixty one they were recruited for different periods and on different conditions some were enlisted for six months some for a year some without any condition as to where they were to serve others were not to be sent out of the state the recruits were principally men from regiments stationed there and already in the service bound for three years if the war lasted that long the city was filled with union fugitives who had been driven by guerrilla bands to take refuge with the national troops they were in a deplorable condition and must have starved but for the support the government gave them they had generally made their escape with a team or two sometimes a yoke of oxen with a mule or a horse in the lead a little bedding besides their clothing and some food had been thrown into the wagon all else of their worldly goods were abandoned and appropriated by their former neighbors for the union man in missouri who stayed at home during the rebellion if he was not immediately under the protection of the national troops was at perpetual war with his neighbors i stopped the recruiting service and disposed the troops about the outskirts of the city so as to guard all approaches order was soon restored i had been at jefferson city but a few days when i was directed from department headquarters to fit out an expedition to lexington boonville and chillicothe in order to take from the banks in those cities all the funds they had and send them to st louis the western army had not yet been supplied with transportation it became necessary therefore to press into the service teams belonging to sympathizers with the rebellion or to hire those of union men this afforded an opportunity of giving employment to such of the refugees within our lines as had teams suitable for our purposes they accepted the service with alacrity as fast as troops could be got off they were moved west some twenty miles or more in seven or eight days from my assuming command at jefferson city i had all the troops except a small garrison at an advanced position and expected to join them myself the next day but my campaigns had not yet begun for while seated at my office door with nothing further to do until it was time to start for the front i saw an officer of rank approaching who proved to be colonel jefferson c davis i had never met him before but he introduced himself by handing me an order for him to proceed to jefferson city and relieve me of the command the orders directed that i should report at department headquarters at st louis without delay to receive important special instructions it was about an hour before the only regular train of the day would start i therefore turned over to colonel davis my orders and hurriedly stated to him the progress that had been made to carry out the department instructions already described i had at that time but one staff officer doing myself all the detail work usually performed by an adjutant general in an hour after being relieved from the command i was on my way to st louis leaving my single staff officer to follow the next day with our horses and baggage the important special instructions which i received the next day assigned me to the command of the district of southeast missouri embracing all the territory south of st louis in missouri 
as well as all southern Illinois. At first, I was to take personal command of a combined expedition that had been ordered for the capture of Colonel Jefferson Thompson, a sort of independent or partisan commander who was disputing with us the possession of southeast Missouri. Troops had been ordered to move from Ironton to Cape Girardeau, sixty or seventy miles to the southeast on the Mississippi River, while the forces at Cape Girardeau had been ordered to move to Jacksonville, ten miles out towards Ironton, and troops at Cairo and Birds Point, at the junction of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, were to hold themselves in readiness to go down the Mississippi to Belmont, eighteen miles below, to be moved west from there when an officer should come to command them. I was the officer who had been selected for this purpose. Cairo was to become my headquarters when the expedition terminated. In pursuance of my orders, I established my temporary headquarters at Cape Girardeau and sent instructions to the commanding officer at Jackson to inform me of the approach of General Prentiss from Ironton. Hired wagons were kept moving night and day to take additional rations to Jackson to supply the troops when they started from there. Neither General Prentiss nor Colonel Marsh, who commanded at Jackson, knew their destination. I drew up all the instructions for the contemplated move, and kept them in my pocket until I should hear of the junction of our troops at Jackson. Two or three days after my arrival at Cape Girardeau, word came that General Prentiss was approaching that place, Jackson. I started at once to meet him there and to give him his orders. As I turned the first corner of a street, after starting, I saw a column of cavalry passing the next street in front of me. I turned and rode around the block the other way, so as to meet the head of the column. I found there General Prentiss himself with a large escort. He had halted his troops at Jackson for the night, and had come on himself to Cape Girardeau, leaving orders for his command to follow him in the morning. I gave the general his orders, which stopped him at Jackson, but he was very much aggrieved at being placed under another brigadier general, particularly as he believed himself to be the senior. He had been a brigadier, in command at Cairo, while I was mustering officer at Springfield without any rank but we were nominated at the same time for the United States Service, and both our commissions bore date May 17, 1861. By virtue of my former Army rank, I was, by law, the senior. General Prentiss failed to get orders to his troops to remain at Jackson, and the next morning early they were reported as approaching Cape Girardeau, I then ordered the general very peremptorily to countermarch his command and take it back to Jackson. He obeyed the order, but bade his command adieu when he got them to Jackson and went to St. Louis and reported himself. This broke up the expedition, but little harm was done as Jefferson Thompson moved light and to no fixed place for even nominal headquarters. He was as much at home in Arkansas as he was in Missouri, and would keep out of the way of a superior force. Prentiss was sent to another part of the state. General Prentiss made a great mistake on the above occasion, one that he would not have committed later in the war. When I came to know him better, I regretted it much. In consequence of this occurrence, he was off duty in the field when the principal campaign at the West was going on, and his juniors received promotion, while he was where none could be obtained. He would have been next to myself in rank in the district of southeast Missouri, 
by virtue of his services in the mexican war he was a brave and very earnest soldier no man in the service was more sincere in his devotion to the cause for which we were battling none more ready to make sacrifices or risk life in it on the fourth of september i removed my headquarters to cairo and found colonel richard oglesby in command of the post we had never met at least not to my knowledge after my promotion i had ordered my brigadier general's uniform from new york but it had not yet arrived so that i was in citizen's dress the colonel had his office full of people mostly from the neighboring states of missouri and kentucky making complaints or asking favors he evidently did not catch my name when i was presented for on my taking a piece of paper from the table where he was seated and writing the order assuming command of the district of southeast missouri colonel richard j oglesby to command the post at bird's point and handing it to him he put on an expression of surprise that looked a little as if he would like to have some one identify me but he surrendered the office without question the day after i assumed command at cairo a man came to me who said he was a scout of general fremont he reported that he had just come from columbus a point on the mississippi twenty miles below on the kentucky side and that troops had started from there or were about to start to seize paducah at the mouth of the tennessee there was no time for delay i reported by telegraph to the department commander the information i had received and added that i was taking steps to get off that night to be in advance of the enemy in securing that important point there was a large number of steamers lying at cairo and a good many boatmen were staying in the town it was the work of only a few hours to get the boats manned with coal aboard and steamed up troops were also designated to go aboard the distance from cairo to paducah is about forty-five miles i did not wish to get there before daylight of the sixth and directed therefore that the boat should lie at anchor out in the stream until the time to start not having received an answer to my first dispatch i again telegraphed to department headquarters that i should start for paducah that night unless i received further orders hearing nothing we started before midnight and arrived early the following morning anticipating the enemy by probably not over six or eight hours it proved very fortunate that the expedition against jefferson thompson had been broken up had it not been the enemy would have seized paducah and fortified it to our very great annoyance when the national troops entered the town the citizens were taken by surprise i never after saw such consternation depicted on the faces of the people men women and children came out of their doors looking pale and frightened at the presence of the invader they were expecting rebel troops that day in fact nearly four thousand men from columbus were at that time within ten or fifteen miles of paducah on their way to occupy the place i had but two regiments and one battery with me but the enemy did not know this and returned to columbus i stationed my troops at the best points to guard the roads leading into the city left gunboats to guard the river fronts and by noon was ready to start on my return to cairo before leaving however i addressed a short printed proclamation to the citizens of paducah assuring them of our peaceful intentions that we had come among them to protect them against the enemies of our country and that all who chose could continue with their usual avocations with assurance of the protection of the government 
This was evidently a relief to them, but the majority would have much preferred the presence of the other army. I reinforced Paducah rapidly from the troops at Cape Girardeau, and a day or two later, General C. F. Smith, a most accomplished soldier, reported at Cairo and was assigned to the command of the post at the mouth of the Tennessee. In a short time it was well fortified, and a detachment was sent to occupy Smithland at the mouth of the Cumberland. The state government of Kentucky at that time was rebel in sentiment, but wanted to preserve an armed neutrality between the North and the South, and the governor really seemed to think the state had a perfect right to maintain a neutral position. The rebels already occupied two towns in the state, Columbus and Hickman on the Mississippi, and at the very moment the national troops were entering Paducah from the Ohio front, General Lloyd Tilgman, a Confederate, with his staff and a small detachment of men, were getting out in the other direction, while, as I have already said, nearly 4,000 Confederate troops were on Kentucky soil on their way to take possession of the town. But in the estimation of the governor and of those who thought with him, this did not justify the national authorities in invading the soil of Kentucky. I informed the legislature of the state of what I was doing, and my action was approved by the majority of that body. On my return to Cairo, I found authority from department headquarters for me to take Paducah, if I felt strong enough. But very soon after, I was reprimanded from the same quarters for my correspondence with the legislature and warned against a repetition of the offense. Soon after I took command at Cairo, General Fremont entered into arrangements for the exchange of the prisoners captured at Camp Jackson in the month of May. I received orders to pass them through my lines to Columbus as they presented themselves with proper credentials. Quite a number of these prisoners I had been personally acquainted with before the war. Such of them as I had so known were received at my headquarters as old acquaintances, and ordinary routine business was not disturbed by their presence. On one occasion, when several were present in my office, my intention to visit Cape Girardeau the next day to inspect the troops at that point was mentioned. Something transpired which postponed my trip. But a steamer employed by the government was passing a point some twenty or more miles above Cairo the next day, when a section of rebel artillery with proper escort brought her to. A major, one of those who had been at my headquarters the day before, came at once aboard, and after some search made a direct demand for my delivery. It was hard to persuade him that I was not there. This officer was Major Barrett of St. Louis. I had been acquainted with his family before the war. End of section 19 Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 20. General Fremont in Command. Movement against Belmont. Battle of Belmont. A narrow escape after the battle. From the occupation of Paducah, up to the early part of November, nothing important occurred with the troops under my command. 
I was reinforced from time to time, and the men were drilled and disciplined, preparatory for the service which was sure to come. By the 1st of November I had not fewer than 20,000 men, most of them under good drill and ready to meet any equal body of men who, like themselves, had not yet been in an engagement. They were growing impatient at lying idle so long, almost in hearing of the guns of the enemy they had volunteered to fight against. I asked on one or two occasions to be allowed to move against Columbus. It could have been taken soon after the occupation of Paducah, but before November it was so strongly fortified that it would have required a large force and a long siege to capture it. In the latter part of October, General Fremont took the field in person and moved from Jefferson City against General Sterling Price, who was then in the state of Missouri with a considerable command. About the 1st of November, I was directed from department headquarters to make a demonstration on both sides of the Mississippi River with the view of detaining the rebels at Columbus within their lines. Before my troops could be got off, I was notified from the same quarter that there were some 3,000 of the enemy on the St. Francis River, about 50 miles west or southwest from Cairo, and was ordered to send another force against them. I dispatched Colonel Oglesby at once with troops sufficient to compete with the reported number of the enemy. On the 5th, word came from the same source that the rebels were about to detach a large force from Columbus to be moved by boats down the Mississippi and up the White River in Arkansas in order to reinforce Price, and I was directed to prevent this movement if possible. I accordingly sent a regiment from Bird's Point under Colonel W. H. L. Wallace to overtake and reinforce Oglesby with orders to march to New Madrid, a point some distance below Columbus on the Missouri side. At the same time, I directed General C. F. Smith to move all the troops he could spare from Paducah directly against Columbus, halting them, however, a few miles from the town to await further orders from me. Then I gathered up all the troops at Cairo and Fort Holt, except suitable guards, and moved them down the river on steamers, convoyed by two gunboats accompanying them myself. My force consisted of a little over 3,000 men, and embraced five regiments of infantry, two guns, and two companies of cavalry. We dropped down the river on the 6th, to within about six miles of Columbus, debarked a few men on the Kentucky side, and established pickets to connect with the troops from Paducah. I had no orders which contemplated an attack by the national troops, nor did I intend anything of the kind when I started out from Cairo. But after we started, I saw that the officers and men were elated at the prospect of at last having the opportunity of doing what they had volunteered to do, fight the enemies of their country. I did not see how I could maintain discipline or retain the confidence of my command if we should return to Cairo without an effort to do something. Columbus, besides being strongly fortified, contained a garrison much more numerous than the force I had with me. It would not do, therefore, to attack that point. About two o'clock on the morning of the 7th, I learned that the enemy was crossing troops from Columbus to the west bank to be dispatched, presumably, after Oglesby. I knew there was a small camp of Confederates at Belmont, immediately opposite Columbus, and I speedily resolved to push down the river, land on the Missouri side, capture Belmont, break up the camp, and return. Accordingly, the pickets above Columbus were drawn in at once, 
and about daylight the boats moved out from shore. In an hour we were debarking on the west bank of the Mississippi, just out of range of the batteries at Columbus. The ground on the west shore of the river, opposite Columbus, is low and in places marshy and cut up with sloughs. The soil is rich and the timber large and heavy. There were some small clearings between Belmont and the point where we landed, but most of the country was covered with the native forests. We landed in front of a cornfield. When the debarkation commenced, I took a regiment down the river to post it as a guard against surprise. At that time I had no staff officer who could be trusted with that duty. In the woods, at a short distance below the clearing, I found a depression, dry at the time, but which at high water became a slough or bayou. I placed the men in the hollow, gave them their instructions, and ordered them to remain there until they were properly relieved. These troops, with the gunboats, were to protect our transports. Up to this time, the enemy had evidently failed to divine our intentions. From Columbus, they could, of course, see our gunboats and transports loaded with troops, but the force from Paducah was threatening them from the land side, and it was hardly to be expected that if Columbus was our object, we would separate our troops by a wide river. They doubtless thought we meant to draw a large force from the east bank, then embark ourselves, land on the east bank, and make a sudden assault on Columbus before their divided command could be united. About eight o'clock we started from the point of debarkation, marching by the flank. After moving in this way for a mile or a mile and a half, I halted where there was marshy ground covered with a heavy growth of timber in our front, and deployed a large part of my force as skirmishers. By this time the enemy discovered that we were moving upon Belmont, and sent out troops to meet us. Soon after we had started in line, his skirmishers were encountered and fighting commenced. This continued, growing fiercer and fiercer, for about four hours, the enemy being forced back gradually until he was driven into his camp. Early in this engagement my horse was shot under me, but I got another from one of my staff, and kept well up with the advance until the river was reached. The officers and men engaged at Belmont were then under fire for the first time. Veterans could not have behaved better than they did up to the moment of reaching the rebel camp. At this point, they became demoralized from their victory and failed to reap its full reward. The enemy had been followed so closely that when he reached the clear ground on which his camp was pitched, he beat a hasty retreat over the river bank which protected him from our shots and from view. This precipitate retreat at the last moment enabled the national forces to pick their way without hindrance through the abatis, the only artificial defense the enemy had. The moment the camp was reached, our men laid down their arms and commenced rummaging the tents to pick up trophies. Some of the higher officers were little better than the privates. They galloped about from one cluster of men to another, and at every halt delivered a short eulogy upon the Union cause and the achievements of the command. All this time the troops we had been engaged with for four hours lay crouched under cover of the river bank, ready to come up and surrender if summoned to do so, but finding that they were not pursued, they worked their way up the river and came up on the bank between us and our transports. I saw, at the same time, two steamers coming from the Columbus side towards the west shore, above us, black or gray, with soldiers from boiler deck to roof. Some of my men were engaged in firing from captured guns, 
at empty steamers down the river out of range cheering at every shot i tried to get them to turn their guns upon the loaded steamers above and not so far away my efforts were in vain at last i directed my staff officers to set fire to the camps this drew the fire of the enemy's guns located on the heights of columbus they had abstained from firing before probably because they were afraid of hitting their own men or they may have supposed until the camp was on fire that it was still in the possession of their friends about this time too the men we had driven over the bank were seen in line up the river between us and our transports the alarm surrounded was given the guns of the enemy and the report of being surrounded brought officers and men completely under control at first some of the officers seemed to think that to be surrounded was to be placed in a hopeless position where there was nothing to do but surrender but when i announced that we had cut our way in and could cut our way out just as well it seemed a new revelation to officers and soldiers they formed line rapidly and we started back to our boats with the men deployed as skirmishers as they had been on entering camp the enemy was soon encountered but his resistance this time was feeble again the confederates sought shelter under the river banks we could not stop however to pick them up because the troops we had seen crossing the river had debarked by this time and were nearer our transports than we were it would be prudent to get them behind us but we were not again molested on our way to the boats from the beginning of the fighting our wounded had been carried to the houses at the rear near the place of debarkation i now set the troops to bringing their wounded to the boats after this had gone on for some little time i rode down the road without even a staff officer to visit the guard i had stationed over the approach to our transports i knew the enemy had crossed over from columbus in considerable numbers and might be expected to attack us as we were embarking this guard would be encountered first and as they were in a natural entrenchment would be able to hold the enemy for a considerable time my surprise was great to find there was not a single man in the trench riding back to the boat i found the officer who had commanded the guard and learned that he had withdrawn his force when the main body fell back at first i ordered the guard to return but finding that it would take some time to get the men together and march them back to their position i countermanded the order then fearing that the enemy we had seen crossing the river below might be coming upon us unawares i rode out in the field to our front still entirely alone to observe whether the enemy was passing the field was grown up with corn so tall and thick as to cut off the view of even a person on horseback except directly along the rows even in that direction owing to the overhanging blades of corn the view was not extensive i had not gone more than a few hundred yards when i saw a body of troops marching past me not fifty yards away i looked at them for a moment and then turned my horse towards the river and started back first in a walk and when i thought myself concealed from the view of the enemy as fast as my horse could carry me when at the river bank i still had to ride a few hundred yards to the point where the nearest transport lay the cornfield in front of our transports terminated at the edge of a dense forest before i got back the enemy had entered this forest and had opened a brisk fire upon the boats our men with the exception of details that had gone to the front after the wounded were now either aboard the transports or very near them those who were not aboard soon got there and the boats pushed off i was the only man of the national army 
between the rebels and our transports. The captain of a boat that had just pushed out but had not started recognized me and ordered the engineer not to start the engine. He then had a plank run out for me. My horse seemed to take in the situation. There was no path down the bank, and every one acquainted with the Mississippi River knows that its banks, in a natural state, do not vary at any great angle from the perpendicular. My horse put his fore feet over the bank without hesitation or urging, and with his hind feet well under him, slid down the bank and trotted aboard the boat, twelve or fifteen feet away, over a single gangplank. I dismounted and went at once to the upper deck. The Mississippi River was low on the 7th of November, 1861, so that the banks were higher than the heads of men standing on the upper decks of the steamers. The rebels were some distance back from the river, so that their fire was high and did us but little harm. Our smokestack was riddled with bullets, but there were only three men wounded on the boats, two of whom were soldiers. When I first went on deck, I entered the captain's room adjoining the pilot house and threw myself on a sofa. I did not keep that position a moment, but rose to go out on the deck to observe what was going on. I had scarcely left when a musket ball entered the room, struck the head of the sofa, passed through it, and lodged in the foot. When the enemy opened fire on the transports, our gunboats returned it with vigor. They were well out in the stream and some distance down, so that they had to give but very little elevation to their guns to clear the banks of the river. Their position very nearly enfiladed the line of the enemy while he was marching through the cornfield. The execution was very great, as we could see at the time, and as I afterwards learned more positively. We were very soon out of range and went peacefully on our way to Cairo, every man feeling that Belmont was a great victory and that he had contributed his share to it. Our loss at Belmont was 485 in killed, wounded, and missing. About 125 of our wounded fell into the hands of the enemy. We returned with 175 prisoners and two guns, and spiked four other pieces. The loss of the enemy, as officially reported, was 642 men killed, wounded, and missing. We had engaged about 2,500 men, exclusive of the guard left with the transports. The enemy had about 7,000, but this includes the troops brought over from Columbus who were not engaged in the first defense of Belmont. The two objects for which the Battle of Belmont was fought were fully accomplished. The enemy gave up all idea of detaching troops from Columbus. His losses were very heavy for that period of the war. Columbus was beset by people looking for their wounded or dead kin to take them home for medical treatment or burial. I learned later, when I had moved further south, that Belmont had caused more mourning than almost any other battle up to that time. The national troops acquired a confidence in themselves at Belmont that did not desert them through the war. The day after the battle, I met some officers from General Polk's command, arranged for permission to bury our dead at Belmont, and also commenced negotiations for the exchange of prisoners. When our men went to bury their dead, before they were allowed to land, they were conducted below the point where the enemy had engaged our transports. Some of the officers expressed a desire to see the field, but the request was refused with the statement that we had no dead there. While on the truce boat, I mentioned to an officer whom I had known both at West Point and in the Mexican War, that I was in the cornfield near their troops when they passed. 
that I had been on horseback and had worn a soldier's overcoat at the time. This officer was on General Polk's staff. He said both he and the general had seen me, and that Polk had said to his men, There is a Yankee. You may try your marksmanship on him if you wish. But nobody fired at me. Belmont was severely criticized in the North as a wholly unnecessary battle, barren of results, or the possibility of them from the beginning. If it had not been fought, Colonel Oglesby would probably have been captured or destroyed with his 3,000 men. Then I should have been culpable indeed. End of section 20 Recorded by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas, jim at jocclev.com.